All right. Good morning. Welcome to the Bucket Courses. I'm Joanne Bungie, and the Planning Committee joins me in welcoming you this morning and happy to see so many of you here. Uh, there will be a, a siren go off this morning if all goes as planned as part of the tornado season drill. So if you hear that, don't rush out of the room. Not to worry, it's okay, it's just a test. You will also, after you silence your cell phone, I want to tell you that this room is wired for T-coil. So if your hearing aid accommodates T-coil, you can turn that on and that will help you a great deal with your hearing as well. That if you weren't here for Mike's first class, it is being aired on Get 12 this week. Last week's class is aired this week. And it is on at 9 o'clock in the morning and at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It is also aired at 3 o'clock a.m. for your early risers. <laughs> or insomniacs, as the case may be. <laughs> you can catch it then, too. <laughs> but the best thing to be is to be here in the Calkins room of the Drake Community Library live to see Mike uh, uh, Gunther present the second class of his four class course on science and society from Newton to Darwin. Please welcome Professor Mike Gunther. Thank you so much. 3 a.m., that's, wow. That's for people who sleep. Or don't sleep. I right. can only imagine what it'll be like to watch at 3 a.m. and to see a lecture on mathematics. It's <laughs> guaranteed to put people to sleep. Um, so, actually, yeah, I want to talk today. Last week we talked about experimentation. I tried to argue about how much of a change it was in terms of not only science, but that all of society was very interested in this new way of generating knowledge, this new way of organizing people into kind of experimental communities. And today I want to talk though about another side of science. There are many sides. Um, one that people sometimes argue is even more important than experimentation, which is mathematics. That science, part of what makes modern science modern is its ability to use mathematics to turn the world into numbers and equations and to discover new structures, new relationships, uh, kind of new understandings of nature through mathematics. And so I'm going to talk today a little bit about where that idea comes from. Um, uh, We'll end up um, talking a, a bit about the metric system uh, and attempts to create new kind of mathematically based systems of measurement um, and the larger influence on society. We live in a world of numbers, right? You can't turn on the television or newspapers without reading about statistics, um, all different numbers. My, my favorite number, I think, that I discovered a few years ago is they measured um, how much of GDP do we spend to actually measure things. Like, how much is measurement part of the time? Right? It's, it's a perfectly lovely ironic. It turns out that we spend almost 7% of GDP on measurement. So it's actually more than science and technology combined in terms of actual money being spent. So we live in a world governed by measurement. And so what we want to do today is talk a little bit about how do we get to that world? What role did science play? Um, what role did mathematics play? Um, and did math have drama to it in the science, early modern period? which we'll try to talk about. And we have a little couple of quotes to start us off here. Galileo, if I started last week's lecture with Bacon, the place to start this week's lecture with Galileo, the person who kind of, in famous, you might have heard a paraphrase of this, the idea that nature is written in the language of mathematics. It speaks to us in the language of math. And, um, Galileo was kind of the central figure in the beginning of the scientific revolution to push this idea that math is the key to unlocking and understanding nature. Um, and in fact, for Galileo, if an experiment is putting a question to nature, it's key that you phrase it in the right language. That you put that question in the right language. Um, and then there's a lot of people in the 19th century who embodied this zeal for quantification, for numbers. But I think you can't find a better figure than Lord Kelvin, you know, who was kind of one of the founders of thermodynamics, who kind of measured everything here. And he has this quote. In fact, if any of you have been to the University of Chicago, over one of their big buildings, they have a famous quote from Lord Kelvin. It says something like, if you cannot measure, you cannot know, or something, which is kind of a little daunting. For a historian who doesn't measure things too much, I find that daunting uh, here. Uh, just to get us a little bit into the spirit, and we have some uh, in the background here is one of the geometric proofs, the light colored uh, from Newton's Principia. I'll talk a little bit about geometry and 
geometric proofs. Um, but let me start, I don't normally talk about other historians when I lecture, I kind of like to focus on the past and the people of the past, but today is going to be a rare exception. I think you can't understand this topic without understanding one scholar, this figure, Alexander Koira, here. I think it's interesting, he's the person who actually invented the term scientific revolution. Uh, we didn't use that term at all until 1939, when he kind of coined it. Koira was a Russian emigre who spent his life in France, he was a philosopher, a historian, he eventually ended up in Princeton, at the Advanced Institute, and he convinced a generation in Europe and America that it was worth doing the history of science. That the history of science is not obsolete old knowledge, but it's actually a discipline worth understanding the ideas of people at the time, because they lived in different worlds than us, they used different techniques, so it's worth trying to reconstruct their past views, their past ideas, and that we learn a lot from that. And so, at the heart of his kind of reconstruction. Why he thought the scientific revolution was so important was because it was math, not experimentalism, that marked the break between the medieval world and our modern world here. Um, so he thought it was an intellectual, even almost a spiritual revolution, to go from believing in nature as a series of qualities, of places, that Aristotelian world of common sense, um, where heavy bodies fall faster than light bodies, you've seen it every day with your eyes, uh, to go from that to a world of equations, geometric proofs, believing that nature can be turned into lines on a page. For Koira, he, he would always wonder, how did people ever make that philosophical leap? It's a leap of faith for him. Um, and it's a huge one with huge consequences. Here, so he was very dismissive of Bacon in the experimental tradition. Um, he once called Bacon kind of a hack. It was in French, so it was a little bit more upscale. But he really thought that scientists do not learn and understand the world by collecting facts, by conducting little experiments. They learn by developing theoretical equations and kind of carefully studying through the language of mathematics the structure of reality. And so he invented a term that you'll sometimes see about nature being mathematized, or the mathematization of nature. But, um, and any of you that have been in practicing, practicing sciences, this is sometimes a tension within different sciences. Is there is one community that believes that all knowledge has to be mathematized, and there might be another community uh, that believes differently. But um, Koira helped a whole generation of people kind of re-see math as the key to science here. And today I want to talk about, he wrote a famous article that I, I often describe as kind of a parable. It really is a really interesting case study about why he thinks mathematics and theory are more important than experiment or observation or empiricism to understanding reality. And so he wrote a famous um, article that studied the first search to find and give a number to a universal constant. So little g, which is basically the force with which gravity accelerates an object to the ground. Here. So I'm not talking about what they sometimes call big G, which is the gravitational constant, so like two bodies. How much do they attract each other since they both have mass and gravity pulls them together? I'm not talking about that number. I'm talking about if I were to drop this remote, how fast does it accelerate to the ground? What's the gravitational pull of the Earth on an object? Um, this is a key number because if you're going to develop a whole new mechanics, a whole new science of motion, if you can't measure acceleration, if you can't measure velocity, things like that, then you have nothing but kind of empty equations. So, it was a great hunt, it took about 150 years, and Koyer wanted to know, how did people actually get this number? Um, and he, he kind of showed that it's a surprising way. So let me start with Galileo himself. Um, uh, Galileo, as I mentioned, believed that all motion could be subject to numbers. You could write it out in equations here. Um, and he believed in a concept of acceleration, that objects actually accelerate. They don't move at a constant motion. And that's opposite to what Aristotle thought. Aristotle thought if you dropped a ball, it would move a certain distance in one second, and it would move double that distance. The second second would move the same amount of distance. So to put it differently, if I drop a ball and it drops three feet in a second, in two seconds it should move six feet. Right? It's a kind of clear empirical test, and it was tied up to his view about why things move and his kind of theory of nature. <laughs> Galileo believed the opposite. He believed that that ball in the second second should drop four times as far. Thought it should be the square of the time here. So we won't get into all the details about kind of why and how he thought it, but this was his hypothesis and his hunch. But the problem that he and all scientists in the 1600s had is that, okay, you believe nature can be expressed in mathematical equations, you believe it can be measured with precision, but you have no tools to do that, right? 
Galileo doesn't have a clock. In fact, in his experiments, he has to use a Roman water clock, which means he takes a big bucket of water, he puts a narrow straw at the bottom, and he lets water fall out over a certain amount of time, and then he weighs the water. And so, in theory, a cup of water that's been sitting there for twice as long should have twice as much water, so it should weigh twice as much. Does that make sense? So he's not measuring seconds or anything like that, like we would think of today's time. He's just measuring, it's like an hourglass. How much kind of, of a substance drips through an aperture, weighing it on the scale? So that is not a good way to measure how fast a ball moves when it falls from huge towers, which is what people wanted him to do. They wanted him to show and prove that his new mathematical theory of dynamics, of motion, could be shown in the real world. And so they would ask him to do this, but he said, you know, there's no way to, to calculate. Um, the ball's just moving too fast. I don't have any good clocks. So being a very clever experimentalist, he decided, well, what if I was able to slow down the motion? So some of you may have heard of these famous inclined plane experiments, yes. where he basically, Galileo decided to create, and here's a kind of artist's rendition, to create this long board in which he hollowed out a smooth groove down the middle, and then took a small marble and rolled it down the inclined plane. And the argument here is that he's watching the same fundamental thing that happens when a ball falls, he's just watching it much more slowly. He's watching gravity pulling it down to the earth, um, and he's kind of reducing air resistance in some ways uh, because it's not moving as fast. And so he starts to kind of measure these along. Um, I'll give you the, just because it's kind of fun to see the different numbers that he calculates. He did this experiment dozens and dozens of times. Here he could put numbers because he was dealing with something so slow. Um, and because he's not dealing with velocity, um, he's dealing with just two variables. How far does the ball move and how long does it move? I think that's important, and if you, because like I said, he can't really measure velocity itself, so he's just looking at those two variables. Um, now these are in his Tuscan measurement of points here, so don't worry about the numbers too much, but you'll notice what Galileo probably noticed, which is there seems to be a relationship here. If you look at this column and this column, these ones over here are the, um, the square of the number on the left, right? So. After two, two units of time, I should not say seconds because these are just like cups of water, right? After two units of time, the ball has traveled four times farther. After three units of time, it's traveled nine times farther. Four units, 16. Five, 25, right? So it seems to be a, a direct mathematical relationship, right? He's figured out that time squ squared is the amount of distance traveled. So he's, he's understood or discovered a fundamental relationship in nature. It can be expressed mathematically um, here. So that itself is a big breakthrough and kind of astounds people. Um, but like I said, he's got this other problem, which is he can prove this basic relationship of proportionality. But he has no way, and other people at the time have no way to actually measure speed or velocity or time in the way that we want to know it, which is in seconds, right? Not in how many cups of water um, exist. So this is the dilemma that Corbett said is important to understanding the birth of modern science. It just, it's committed to math, but it has no way to actually turn the world into numbers, yeah, which is a fundamental problem. And so, did we get numbers through greater experimentation, through greater tools of measurement? I think that's what we'd expect the answer to be, right? Someone must have invented a better clock. They must have discovered a clever way to drop balls differently to measure them. And the answer, just to be very brief, he says no. And so he, he follows the career of um, two different researchers here. Um, I'll get the numbers down here. One is a French philosopher, Mersenne, and the other is an Italian Jesuit philosopher, Riccioli, here. And they're really interesting because they spent a good part of their lives working on this problem. And I think one of the things when you read Coyer's Reconstruction is you realize how much a passion for measurement drove these scientists. These were people who spent days, weeks, and months trying to work on how to measure, trying to develop better experiments. So Mersin developed these different clay balls that would explode on the impact here, created a giant cloud so that he could see it better. He worked on trying to use a pendulum or trying to use his pulse. He kept trying to think of different ways to create kind of human clocks so that he could kind of measure. Um, all of them are trying to find out what is the distance at which a ball or any object will drop in the first second. Um, and therefore to calculate what is the force of acceleration pulling it down. So the interesting thing about Galileo is he proves that proportion very well, but he's actually quite embarrassingly off, and I don't mean to pick on Galileo, but his numbers, he says, 
I think that a ball or any piece of mass will drop seven feet in the first second. Um, and not to give away the game, but the number that we would suggest today is more like 16. So he's off by about half. So it's not an impressive start for an attempt to put numbers. But again, for a guy with a plane and a water clock, you know, he, 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 in fact, he did not even want to release these numbers. He wanted just to focus on the mathematical relationship of square connectedness, not on the actual numbers of acceleration. Where Sven spent several years, he comes up with a number of 12 feet, Riccioli, who I want to talk about in a second, he spends an amazing amount of time and effort. Comes up with a measure of about 13 and a half feet. But both men kind of at the ends of their career realize that you just can't get at this number to experiment. That each time they do these measurements, these are their average numbers, but on one experiment it might be 15, another one it might be nine. I mean, they vary all over the map. So they, they both kind of end up deciding um, that in some ways, it's just not a number that can be reached through experiment. But I did want to point out, Richie Oli, I think, is just a fabulous story. So he decides to do these experiments, um, to drop balls from different towers in Pisa and in Florence. But like everyone, he needs to have some way to calculate time. So he says, I am going to use a pendulum, which Galileo knew about. Pendulums supposedly kind of move in a steady rhythm. So what I want is a pendulum whose oscillation is one second. I can get a pendulum that swings one second, then I can use that very accurately to, to, to catalog the falling of a ball here. So I put up here that he turns nine Jesuits into a human clock. He gets a group of nine of his colleagues to stay, stay up for 24 hours. These guys would watch my show at 3 a.m. So they stay up for 24 hours to count a pendulum. He thinks, he, he thinks that if I make a pendulum about 36 Roman inches, and it should be about a second. Well, how do you test it? So first he tries it against a, a water clock. It seems like it's pretty accurate. Then he tries it against a sundial. It's, it's somewhat accurate. But he realizes you can't measure it against a sundial. What's the only way you can measure time accurately on this Earth here? You measure its rotation as opposed to the heavens. Right? That is the one kind of accurate way without, that's how you, we, even today, you know, that's how you can kind of set clocks. So, he decides for 24 hours, from noon on one day to noon on the next day, I am going to count with my eight or nine Jesuit friends. I'm going to count all the pendulum pulses. So it's about 86,000 that they have to count. So one, two, three, four, five. You can imagine what it is. And I do think it's a great story because it, it kind of, a little bit like experiment, experimentalism, it shows how math had become its own kind of culture, or cult. These were people who loved numbers, who loved counting, who were driven with a passion for it staying up 24 hours. So he does this experiment. He's off by about 150 seconds, which isn't bad. So then he decides to do a second pendulum. Where he shaves it off a little bit shorter. He says, we're going to try this one. So they do it again. This time he's, he shaves off maybe like 30 beats to the pendulum. But then uh, an astronomer friend says, well, you know, the days change in length every day. Right? <laughs> noon is different. They're not the same number of seconds every day at noon because we're so he says, oh, you know, so he goes, okay, I've got to do a sidereal day. So I've got to measure it by stars, when stars cross a celestial meridian, rather than watching when noon, when the sun is at its highest point at noon, right? So he gets his, you know, nine colleagues to do this again three more times, each time getting slightly closer here to this time. And so it's a great story, like I said, about like the kind of passion for mathematics, for precision. The, it takes a lot of effort to measure. This is why we spend 6% of our GDP on measurement. Because it usually takes, sometimes almost her, her, I can't say the word, uh, Herculean effort here, right? sometimes to actually count things. Um, nature does not want to be fit into numbers sometimes easily. Here. And so this was one of Coira's kind of key messages. He traced this long, for about 70 years, different experimentalists have tried to get a more and more accurate experiment that would give them a number for acceleration, for gravity. They were certainly getting closer, but they were off by, you know, even Riccioli, when he finally got his pendulum and started measuring the falling of balls, he still was off by about 20, 25% from what we today would see as the number. Not bad for, you know, um, and Coira would applaud him for his effort, but what to him was so fascinating is the person who solved this problem uh, would be Christopher Huygens, a Dutch mathematician. Um, and Huygens did it not with doing experiments, but just did it on paper. He did it in a matter of a couple months. He solved the problem. He gave us a number for G, which is remarkably accurate. But he did it without having to experiment. He just did it on paper, in his own little mathematical world. And so for Coira, that was a really powerful story about the, the power of math, um, the power of theory sometimes over experimentalism. So 
I'll, I'll try very quickly to explain how Huygens did this. Because I think it's kind of fascinating. It takes us into the world of curves and mathematics. But feel free to stop me. This is a little complicated, but like I said, I think interesting. So Huygens did start with some experiments. He took a pendulum and he thought, well, you know, if I had the pendulum and I attached it to the wall, I let the pendulum swing to the wall, and I let a ball drop at the same time, and I attach them to strings, and I cut them at the exact same moment so that the ball drops exactly when the pendulum drops, and if they both, all I need to do is get the sounds to line up the same. I want the pendulum to hit the wall at exactly the right moment when the ball hits the ground. Um, and then I can get a more accurate experiment. And so his first number was kind of surprisingly large. It was like 16. It would be the distance that a ball would travel in a second. Um, then his next number was like 12 and a half. And so again, it was a wide variety of outcomes. And so it wasn't particularly um, promising in terms of finding a very precise number. I mean, when you're off by two or three numbers. You know, you're wanting to get down to the decimal places. That's not encouraging. So what he does is he makes this move that Courier thinks is important. You, he, the world is messy. It's hard to measure. So go back into mathematics. Go back into studying. Math will somehow let you solve this problem without having to even touch the world, which is a, a really surprising thing to kind of understand. So he does this by actually focusing on the pendulum itself. He thinks, kind of like Riccioli, I'm going to design a pendulum clock. But unlike Riccioli, he's not going to stay up all night for 24 hours trying to count. The kind of guess and test method, right? Shave off a little bit of the pendulum, try it again, try it again. Instead, he says, I want to understand the actual math behind it. I want to understand all of the mathematics of the curve of the pendulum, how it works. And so he goes into kind of geometry here. Now, um, what he discovers is that a normal pendulum, and Galileo was a little bit wrong about this. Galileo thought a normal pendulum, as it swings, it has the same period. Otherwise, it takes the same amount of time to go through its swings, no matter how far you lift up the pendulum to start. It. So the idea that made a pendulum such an interesting timekeeper is that even as it potentially, what we would consider slows down, right? So if you let a pendulum go, it, increasingly over time, the arc gets smaller and smaller, right, as it starts to lose energy. Galileo said it doesn't matter if the arc gets smaller and smaller. It still actually traces out the same amount of time. It's a little counterintuitive to imagine, but the idea is that he, so a pendulum that swings from 45 degrees, and then even as it gets down to just five or six degrees swinging, it actually takes the same amount of time to go from each of those kind of things. So that's the idea. So they call a pendulum an asynchronic device. Otherwise, it keeps equal time, right? Now, Huygens starts studying curves, and he realizes the circle is not an isochronic curve. He starts doing the geometry behind it. He realizes it can't be. In fact, there's only one curve that can be truly isochronic. So that no matter where the pendulum moves along its curve, it's always at the same time. That's a cycloid. So let me just show you an example, because again, it's kind of counterintuitive. And I like playing with graphics here. So you see how the blue ball is going to end up catching up to the yellow ball. So the idea is that, and this is what makes a pendulum so potentially dramatic as a game changer. If you get it in the right curve, like I said, it doesn't matter if it keeps to the eye slowing down. It's actually keeping perfect time. So you can create a clock in which you're constantly giving the pendulum a little nudge or you're letting it kind of get a smaller arc. That's fine. The pendulum is not slowing down. It's just making a smaller arc. But by this principle of mathematics, it's actually keeping the exact same amount of time even as his arc gets smaller. Does that make sense kind of here? So he's trying to find what is the one isochronic curve that a pendulum can make. It's not its normal circle. It's actually what's called a cycle, right? So now we move on to this question, what is a cycle? Why does... Um, Christopher Huygens know what a cycloid is? Why is he studying it? So he's a mathematician. And what mathematicians started doing in the 17th and 18th centuries is they really love studying curves of all different types and studying their properties, their relations. So what a cycloid is, is as you see from this top here, a cycloid is a circle rolling across a flat plane in which one point on its outer diameter is tracing out a line. So what is the curve? And there's all these epicycloids, brachycycloids, there's all these different terms, mathematicians, and they do the same thing like what happens when you spin a parabola around. They're just interested in the curves created by other geometric figures. And you might ask yourself, what would this have to do with real life? Right? I'm sure parents would probably ask, them, what are you studying? Is this in any way useful? And it turns out that it's actually incredibly useful. Like, so there's certain relationships. The, Circle and the radius have relationships to the actual length of the cycloid. But, um, let me flip it upside down just to make it visually a little bit more easy. 
what he's discovering is, is that, okay, so the cycloid is the one path in which if you can get a pendulum to swing, it will keep perfect time. So he's realizing all I need to do is get a pendulum to swing along this arc here. I get like a little diagram here. So flip a cycloid upside down, just make a pendulum swing along it, and you've solved the problem of time cubing. So that's the idea. Now, how do you get a line to swing along a cycloid, right, as opposed to a circle? Here he turns to another branch of mathematics that he's helping to invent, which is the study of curves upon curves. Here. So we're going kind of two, two depths down into the realm of math theory, right? So uh, the most famous example is the involute of a circle. That you can think of like a tetherball, right? If any of you have played tetherball and winds around. So the idea of an involute is what happens when you attach a, a line to a point and then let it unfurl as it wraps around the actual shape here. And I know this is all very dense, but you can kind of see a little bit of the image here and get this idea. Um, and they start studying these curves, and these curves are related very much to the shape that you have. They let you know what is the diameter of the shape, the, the radius, and they have really interesting properties that only mathematicians kind of frankly understand and explain to the rest of us. So what is the involute of a cycloid? What is the actual unrolling of a curve? Oh, sorry. Um, what is the unrolling of a curve that creates a cycloid? It turns out to be another cycloid that's exactly like it. It's one of the few shapes, there's a lot of rhythmic file, but there's only a few shapes in nature in which the involute and the original curve are the exact same. So this is, especially for a mathematician, highly fortuitous because it allows you to calculate all kinds of things about these curves because they're related exactly to each other. So he's basically saying, all I need now is a clock that, whose pendulum looks just like this, whose pendulum curves along its involute. And so what he ends up doing is creating these like, uh, well here you see what a pendulum would look like, moving along involute cheeks so that it deflects the pendulum, so that it moves not in a circle but in a cycle. Does that make sense? Kind of, so it kind of curves up at the end here. And so Huygens is like, this is great. All I have to do is make a pendulum with a silk um, hanging, not a metal rod, but silk. Uh, put the mass on the end. Create these involute cheeks along it. You can see it here, this clock right here. So that I make the pendulum not do a normal circle like it would normally do, but instead curve up at the end to trace out a perfect cycle so I can measure time. Right? Now, because the involute and the actual cycloid share and this is not a geometry class, so I'm not going to get into the details because I don't understand them myself. But because they share certain fundamental principles and relationship to each other, kind of like Galileo did, um, he's able to create a very simple and elegant equation, which he shows that the period of a pendulum, which is represented by t, so how long it takes to go one full, is related directly to pi and the square root of the length of the pendulum over the gravitational constant. So, and when people saw this, mathematicians were just like blown away because what he does is you actually know with a cycloid and an involute, you actually know the exact relationship between the length and the period. They're defined mathematically. So he actually doesn't even have to build the clock to discover what g is. He can just sit in his paper, plug in the numbers, and figure out what the gravitational constant is. I think a way to compare it that all of us are maybe a little more familiar with is the Pythagorean theorem. <coughs> If any of you remember from long ago in school when you learned this, but basically you don't need to know all the sides of a triangle to measure angles. There's certain principles about a triangle that let you know from, if you know a couple angles, you can know other angles, or you can measure the areas of triangles. There's, there's a hidden relationship within triangulation, within triangle that lets us kind of understand the relationship. And he discovers the same thing for these curves. And so he, um, let's see if I can get this to work here. So he calculates, just sitting on his scratch of paper, he calculates, the gravitational constant should be 9.8072 meters per second. Now, he, he actually calculates it in Rhinish feet. Uh, I won't get into it. But I just want to put it just to show you how close it is to today's accepted definition. Yeah. So here's a mathematician that doesn't even get his hands dirty. He just kind of writes with paper. He studies curves. And now he does end up building a clock, the first accurate timekeeper. So I don't want to make him sound like he's totally divorced from practical. But for Coira, this is kind of a startling parable, right? So he, while these other people spent years trying to actually attach a number of computation, Huygens discovered it through math and through um, And like I said, it's with accurate within just a couple of decimal points. It's, it's quite startling here, right? So I just want to continue the story a little bit beyond what Koiba said, because I think this is really... What year was that? Yeah, oh yes, that's a good point. As a historian, I should mention the time period. Yeah, so we're dealing, 
Um, Galileo is in the early 1630s and 40s, um, and uh, right now, that's not right. Huygens is writing in the 1660s here, so this is early on here. Um, and he does other things. He discovers he's studying conical pendulums, pendulums that swing as conic shapes. He's doing a lot of interesting stuff. Um, and he actually ends up developing a, the relationship of gravity kind of as inverse square root. But by studying a pendulum, he's really studying all types of motion, centrifugal, centripetal, even something with gravity here. So he's doing really interesting um, stuff uh, in his work. Um, and it's actually widely read by people at the time. Um, I just wanted to carry on. So a little bit after him, in the early 18th century, other mathematicians take this study even further. And they're like, well, what other interesting properties of, of there are there of involutes? And I think this is, to me, maybe it's going to work a lot in industry in the 18th century, but this is the most interesting to me, which is, I don't know if you know, but all of our gear systems today are based on involutes here. Um, there's a special property about the relationship between um, the involute that's traced out of a circle, um, which makes it the perfect way to have gears interlock. So let me show you an example. This is what almost every modern gearing system looks like here. Um, involutes allow you to have a directly perpendicular line of contact or line of force, as an engineer would say. So if you create gears that are designed as perfect involutes of the circle around which the teeth are moving, then you will basically almost completely reduce friction, noise, um, tension, and torque. You create this perfect line of contact, which was revolutionary because gears were used in everything. And gears were usually made out of wood because they, weren't, they didn't want them to spark, because gears were usually made to grind gunpowder, flour, things that were kind of flammable here. So fire was a huge problem. They also wore out so fast that it was easier to make them out of wood and just replace them every couple months than it was to make them out of iron and have them wear down. So this was a huge change. So sometimes when people say, you know, what has mathematics ever do, done for the Industrial Revolution or for ordinary life or something like that, I think it is fascinating that people studying these seemingly theoretical curves that don't really exist in reality, you know, except for like tetherball. I mean, that studying these curves allow you to understand the fundamental nature of mechanics and motions in the universe. And these are the kinds of examples that start to convince ordinary people like you and me, although maybe some of you are great mathematicians, I should, but convince them that maybe nature really is written in the language of mathematics. Maybe studying equations and curves, the theory of mathematics has direct application to the real world in a way that people, frankly, in the Middle Ages would not have believed. Here. So that's Koiver's position. I think there's a lot of truth and a lot of merit to that. But he has had a lot of critics over the years. And I think these critics are sometimes very interesting because they point out there's a little bit of elitism behind, uh, in some ways, behind this idea that the history of science should be written as basically Galileo, Huygens, Newton, you know, these great disembodied mathematicians floating in the ethereal realm of theory. Um, and what a lot of historians have done when they've looked at the early modern period is they say, well, you know, it's actually quite interesting. If you want to look at who's really mathematizing nature, who's using mathematics every day, it's mostly artisan. And I'll talk a little bit too about women as well. The groups that you would not expect to be closely aligned with mathematics in the early modern world they were. Um, and in fact, if you were to tour Europe in 1600, you'd be probably struck by the fact that geometry taught in universities was largely divorced from everyday life in the real world and that actual applications of math to, to the real world were confined mostly to craftsmen, artisans, and the trades here. So I want to talk a little bit about the kind of social history of math, and kind of a different view here. Now, I don't disagree with Koiva that mathematics was important, or that theory was important, but I just want to talk a little bit about, um, like I said, what to me is the surprising role of different practical mathematicians from the Renaissance up until about the 18th century. So one of the things I want to talk about is this doesn't score high in terms of theory, like the curves and cycloids and the loops, but if you look at who developed the infrastructure of mathematics, it's usually unknown merchants, craftsmen, tradesmen. So one of the examples I like to often bring up is Fibonacci and the development, uh, the importation to Europe of the Hindu Arabic system of numerals. Here. Do any of you remember doing Roman numerals um, in classes yeah. here, right? um, the study of Roman numerals? Those were used all throughout the Middle Ages until um, Fibonacci is starting in the 13th century and then a little bit later in the Renaissance. They were replaced by our modern system of Hindu-Arabic numerals in which 
Um, I put up here just a kind of a sample equation. Um, we can do mathematics today with a system that a, a trained scholar in the Middle Ages would take days to do here. So imagine just if you did, like, put down two Roman numerals, say, like, what would it be like to, to, to multiply 23, right? X, X, 3, 1, 1, 1. Multiply that by 7, 5, 1, 1. Right? The first thing you do is you put them up on paper, you line them up, and you'd start doing the technique that you learned in grade school about how you multiply one digit by one. Otherwise, what we have is a remarkably effective system to calculate things, to divide, to multiply, to add and subtract, that didn't exist in the Middle Ages. And it was imported and developed by mathematicians, I mean, not by mathematicians, but by merchants, by these people that were called accounting masters or abacus masters. Like, the very techniques of calculation upon which modern science is built were usually created by kind of unknown people, these merchants, um, uh, artisans, different people like that. And the same thing applies to decimal points. Who created decimal points? Who created the techniques of, um, uh, sorry, who created the techniques of algebra, putting X and Ys? Almost all of these things are rooted in metal workers, surveyors, blacksmiths, others like that. And so one of the examples I like to do, and we'll end here, um, in just a second here. We, we go to the 40 minute mark, is that right? Okay, yeah. Um, so let me just briefly kind of talk about uh, the Renaissance here. This is another kind of example. Like, when you study the Renaissance today and you study these lists of people, Brunelleschi, Da Vinci, Ghiberti, Cello, um, they're always presented as artists here. They're not presented as craftsmen or as kind of people involved in practical mathematics, but that's how they were understood during the time period. Like, Increasingly now, if you open a textbook, you'll see these people described as artists and engineers. All of these figures, for instance, were apprenticed as goldsmiths growing up here. And goldsmithing was not just making jewelry. Goldsmithing was dirty, difficult work of melting irons, forging them. You had to know what was called at the time allegation, which is like algebra. Or if any of you remember your like, school book problems of if you mix different substances that have different degrees of density, what's the overall? So they're learning basic techniques of mathematics um, and algebra here. I like to sometimes focus on Brunelleschi because these are the different careers he had throughout his life, even though he's today known most famously for creating the Duomo, the very dome on the cathedral at Florence. And like I said, if you open up an art history book, he's presented solely as an artist, but throughout most of his life, he was actually a clockmaker, map maker, surveyor, goldsmith, architect, military engineer. It's a strange list, don't you think, of professions to have? Military engineer, clockmaker. What unites these things together? You could say the same thing of Da Vinci, Galileo. Like, what made a person suitable in the early modern period to build a fort, to do a painting, um, to <coughs> clear a river? And the answer is, is that we all shared a mathematical training. We all knew how to turn nature into numbers. Um, and Brunelleschi especially is really interesting on this front because he's the one who invented the idea of linear perspective. He did this kind of famous experiment that some of you may have heard of in Florence where he was looking at the baptistry outside of the cathedral. And he created this um, experiment where he created a mirror, created lines of sight. This is what it would look like, kind of an artist's rendition to see. And he was understanding, he started to understand the basic principles that sight is basically applied mathematics. Here's another example of showing what sight is like and what perspective is about here. There are different lines, mathematical lines, that of course don't exist in nature, but you're, you're trying to turn nature into mathematics there, so you create these lines. And when you're doing a painting, what you're basically doing is seeing where those lines intersect the plane. So the hyper-realism, the detail, everything that people love about Florentine art is itself really a form of applied mathematics. And that's what makes an engineer, a surveyor, a good painter. Or as the Renaissance tried to say, you know, they started developing these equations. If you have a beautiful painting, if I want to take this, this isn't a beautiful painting, but if I wanted to take this piece here and I wanted to put this on a dome, a dome that's curved, that I'd be looking at from 60 feet below, how would I distort this image in order to make it look real to someone 60 feet below looking at it on a curved surface? That's what the mathematical techniques that the Renaissance develops through linear perspective, stereographic perspective, they start developing the technique of designing blueprints. Basically, just reduce everything in the world to a series of coordinates that you can plot out on a grid, and that with trigonomic equations you can multiply in order to change them so that we can project them onto a curve, different things like that. This is basically, it's interesting, painting and surveying or map making are basically the same thing. 
They're both the same form of kind of applied science. And so I'll stop here, but basically for people that you know, want to think about how was nature mathematized, it's certainly true that great mathematicians like Huygens and Newton are important, but so too are the people who convinced us to think of the world as a series of coordinates, as a series of lines and numbers. Yeah. There's a movie that's coming out called Tim's Blue Mirror. Okay. Uh, it's coming out in the next week or so. Uh, trying to find it will be hard, but it's about somebody that proved that does a painting now by using the mathematical proof how the mirror did it. Okay. So yeah, the comment was, I, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned it, there's a movie coming out called Tim's Vermeer yeah. that's about um, yes. a, a painting that I guess is being, they're using reverse techniques of mathematical perspective to decide whether it was done by them or not. And these artists are doing the same thing with colors, they're starting to turn colors into mathematical equations and trying to create color wheels and understand the relationship mathematically between different colors. So they basically, whatever the problem is, whether it's a clock, a fort, I'll show some examples later, but they're basically trying to reduce it into mathematics so that they can create more realistic, more pleasing images. And so that's, I'll talk about how that ends up shaping science afterwards. So I'm sorry for running over, but we'll, we'll pause here. <laughs> So at the end there, I'm going to just go back one second just to make sure that it's kind of all clear about this idea of mathematical perspective and I was kind of moving very quickly, but I just wanted to just to underscore that point about the idea of that the world we see in the encounter, whether it's buildings, the landscape, any part of nature, and it can somehow be turned into coordinates. Um, is, like I said, a really interesting idea that comes out of this Renaissance cauldron where these artisans are working on surveying, they're working on all types of mathematical projects. And so here's an example of these two images that kind of went through. They started developing gridded paper, and they started developing what's called the sportello, this kind of grid. And what they're doing is kind of converting, in this sense, it's a landscape painting. But the person here is converting it into a different um, projection is the mathematical term. They're changing the equation of the coordinates so that they're making it more curved or less curved. Every time you look at a map, um, you're looking not at what reality looks like, but a mathematical representation of reality. Because a curved globe can never be flattened without distorting it. You, you know, if you take a, deflate a ball and try to stretch it out, it'll be some way distorted. So you have to choose, do you want to distort the size, the shape, or the relative position of the image. So these are the things that these artists and engineers were working on all the equations to do. Um, and so, and, and I love the images that come out of the Renaissance that show this kind of hyper-geometrization of everything here. Um, which, like I said, it taught a large group of wealthy elites actually to think about nature um, as, as if it could be mathematized. And then, there are all of these, um, originally the, the skills of perspective, projection, all these mathematical techniques were handed down in guilds by artisans, one master training another here. It's the kind of thing that you would surprisingly learn when you were a goldsmith. You'd learn these techniques here, um, and then you could apply it to other fields. Um, but then they start creating these popular manuals that are used all throughout to train artisans in every field how to draw um, items in perspective. Um, and you have the development of what I think is a really interesting um, although, you know, it could seem a little boring on its face, but the development of blueprints, which is so startling because it allows people to communicate complex ideas across potentially vast space. So I can communicate a set of plans to someone hundreds of miles away and they can understand exactly in mathematical proportion what I want done. But it's also a social space. Like, I might be a doctor, you might be an architect, but we can communicate because we share the same language of mathematics, the same way to read a blueprint. And that's very different if you look at like artisan sketches from the Middle Ages where it was clear that millwrights, blacksmiths, architects, they all had their different ways of drawing, and they had different ways of communicating, different vocabulary. They lived in different worlds, in a sense. And so one of the interesting things about mathematics is how it kind of erases all those distinctions. It becomes a universal language that people can communicate in. Yeah. 
And, you know, it extends deep. One of the things I thought I'd bring in an image of is, some of you might be familiar with Chippendale furniture from the 18th century, or maybe not, but Chippendale was a famous producer of furniture in 18th century England. And when you would get one of his collecting guidebooks, not only were his artisans trained in mathematical perspective, they built every piece of furniture according to a blueprint, which is, I think, surprising to, to realize, but customers were expected to also buy. So the catalogs themselves have all of the different plans and elevation, orthographic projections. So by the late 18th century, you really start to see that it, it's kind of expected that everyone understands, they have basic mathematical literacy. They understand how to read maps, how to read blueprints. Um, uh, I can apply, I mentioned fort building and military engineering. Military engineers had to understand all this complex geometry to build what in the 17th and 18th century become these incredibly complex forts in which all the angles are laid out for lines of fire. Things like that. So again, you might have a sculptor who's one day working on a building, next day a clock, next day a military engineering. Maybe he's making maps using different projection techniques here. Um, my favorite example, typographers, people who create print, actually have to be trained in mathematical perspective. I don't know if you realize this, but most of the type from the early modern period is designed with specific geometric principles. Here. So this is an example of Carl, Car, I'm trying to remember, Carlson type. Here from the 1720s, and it's designed, as you see here on this grid, it has per perfect proportions as far as the ratios of these circles creating the G, and so a lot of what was, so even to be a printer, you'd have to be trained in all these mathematical techniques about how to space out letters, how to design pleasing typography. Um, and of course, to do this, you have to use tools, and this is something that Koyra would not want to talk about, but the world of mathematical tools of practice. So not just theory, but actual tools. And this was a huge trade in the 18th century, 17th century, well into the 19th century. Mathematical instruments. People, every kind of gentleman, every artisan had these cases of instruments with all kinds of slide rules, parallel rules, sectors, secants, different types of compasses, quadrants. You had to be able to turn nature into mathematical lines on paper, or vice versa, how to read a blueprint to turn mathematical lines into actual objects. My favorite example of this is actually George Washington. If you go to the Library of Congress, um, George Washington has, when he was a young boy, his education had kind of three pillars, which I think are fascinating. One is he copied out this book of rules of etiquette. He spent a lot of time thinking about courtly etiquette, and so there's these rules and maxims of behavior that Washington famously wrote out. This second volume of school books is all about the legal and political forms that you need to know to be a Virginia gentleman of the 18th century. So how do you impanel a jury? How do you write out a deed? How do you write out an indenture? So it's all these legal forms, and he's copying out like how to do all of this thing. And then the third book is his geometry book. I think it's really interesting because Washington never went to school. He learned at home. And the fact that, um, and he's not often included when you talk about the Enlightenment or science. It's always Jefferson or Madison or others. But George Washington, kind of, he and his family knew that in order to be a kind of productive member of society for his aspirations, that he had to be trained in geometry and these kind of skills of practical mathematics. And, and some of you may know that Washington made his early living as a surveyor. Going back to that example of the military engineers, he was expected as a, if you were going to be a commander, you were expected to be able to read maps, to be able to design fortifications. So all of these practical mathematical skills were used by a wide swath, not only artisans, but also a lot of the professional classes as well, people who wanted to rule in the military thing. So like I said, I think there's a really interesting way in which math was woven into society, and that, that actually affected the way science itself developed. I think there was an important influence here. Um, I just want to take a couple minutes to talk about another, I think, surprising aspect, which is the, the prominent role of women in mathematics in the early modern period. Because I think in our own culture, we often bemoan the fact that there seems to be a disconnect between women and mathematics, and there's a lot of talk about why that is or how it is. But it, that was not a problem that people faced in the 17th and 18th centuries. You know, it was kind of quite the opposite. Women were expected to be well-versed and were well-versed in mathematics. In fact, if you look at an older dictionary, if you look at the word calculator, it's not a device, it's a woman. A woman who tabulates numbers. <laughs> um, women work the calculators in most astronomical, physical, other kinds of work, workshops or laboratories. So I wanted to do as a case study this example of astronomers. It's kind of one of these remarkable facts that almost one out of five astronomers in continental Europe during this period of the scientific revolution was a woman here. And 
Maybe that isn't surprising, but I think that we kind of would assume that women didn't have a place in the scientific revolution. And if they did, they certainly wouldn't have had one in terms of math. But it actually turns out to be kind of the opposite is the case here. And historians start to look into this. Why were women so dominant in astronomy? It turns out that a lot of it, a lot of it had to do with this emphasis on the guild system. Here. I was telling you about how artisans, craftsmen, they were trained in mathematics, they used it in everyday life. Women had a powerful role in the workshop and in the guild tradition. And in fact, in the continent, in Germany and other places, you could not be a guild master, you could not run a workshop, be a master, without a wife. It was legally required that you have a wife. Because a guild mistress was an official position. She was kind of like the deputy master of the house and of the workshop. She had legal responsibilities. Um, she almost always was trained in the, the craft that her husband was in. So she was expected to take over the craft when her husband was away, when he was ill, and especially when he died. Um, the ideal would not be to have the woman working for the next 20 or 30 years, but that she would be holding the job until uh, a son, or potentially a daughter, took it over. But so if you went to Europe in the 1700s, you would have found women running shops, you know, involved in all of these trades, they had a much more powerful and integrated role in society than they would in the 19th century, ironically. So, um, so there's this kind of aspect here, and especially astronomy. One of the interesting things is astronomy took place in the home um, here, as did a lot of sciences, frankly. But the, an astronomical observatory was almost always an apartment on the top floor of a house. And it was very much a kind of family affair, because you had to stay up all night watching the stars, it involved immense amounts of calculation for tables to create these star charts and to the calculations as far as if you observe an object, you have to calculate for refraction because light bends. And so astronomy creates lots of mathematics. And so women, as far as wives, daughters, um, apprentices, everyone would kind of be living in the home. In fact, if you wanted to be an astronomer, you would not go to university. You would be trained in the home by a master astronomer. So what's interesting is that science seems to kind of have adopted the structure and the values of the guild system in this early period, especially in Europe, in these mathematical sciences, so like astronomy and others. And so that gave a really powerful role. And I mentioned the example, this is an image of uh, uh, Hevelius here. I'm trying to think of the, it's a Casper, I'm trying to think of the, the, the husband's name. Right? Elisabetta is the one I want to talk about today. She and uh, Maria Winkelmann, these were two famous astronomers in Europe who wrote in Latin to um, Catherine the Great, to Voltaire. They published. They were widely known. Uh, both of them were widows whose husbands had been astronomers. And they both ran um, kind of semi-royal observatories. Um, so they were in charge of entire kind of workshops here. And so there's this very interesting role of women there. And it extended to other fields. I, I love this portrait by uh, Jacques David the chemist Lavoisier and his wife. And you'll often see this with portraits of the Enlightenment. The science was really a family affair. So Lavoisier had his wife, sorry, Lavoisier had his wife doing the calculations for him. She also did all the beautiful engravings for his work. And again, we have to remember that drawing in this time period is mathematical drawing. We're drawing in perfect, precise rules. So there's a sense in which women, even outside of the observatory, women were involved almost intimately with every um, kind of aspect of scientific practice here. Ironically, it would be attempts to professionalize and publish, make science more public, to get it out of the home into professional academies in which you had to have a professional accreditation. That would be the great move of the 19th century, the great movement within science to make it more public, more professional. And that would prove the kind of death knell of women in science. That they would not, it was one thing for women to work in the home, to work as besides husbands, um, above their sons or daughters, but it was another thing for them to have official accreditation in public entry. So in the 19th century, you see women being forced out of science um, kind of by large tokens here. Um, so that said, I'm going to spend the remainder of my time talking about um, the metric system here, which was this huge endeavor to create. Um, it was the moment in which science was going to create a, a brand new system for measurement. Here. And in some ways, it's kind of it's very revealing because it's a moment of tension between the two things I've been talking about, between the world of theory and advanced mathematics and the world of everyday mathematics and practical mathematics. Here. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the metric system uh, that was developed. And so we're talking in terms of time period here, uh, 
ideas go all the way back to Huygens that we, we saw earlier when I talked to you about the pendulum um, and his development of it and his calculation of G. One of the things that Huygens says is, well, once you have this one pendulum that is perfectly a second that calculates G, why don't we make the foot just a third of that pendulum? It's about 39 inches long, so if you divide it by three. So Huygens wrote a pamphlet um, called Clock Feet. There he wanted everyone in Europe to get rid of Roman feet, Parisian feet, Rhinish feet, English feet. Let's all use clock feet. Let's just take the, the pendulum that swings in one second, divided by three, and we'll use that. And that was in the 1660s. But from then on, people were always toying with this idea of why don't we create a new system of measurements? Because science is very hard to do when everyone records it in different measurements, and so is commerce, too. It's very hard to trade when everyone is using different things. So by the 18th century, in the Age of Enlightenment, science had much more um, kind of cachet with people, and so there were these much more practical plans, or I should say much more prominent plans to create measurements. So there's really five keys to the metric system that I think make it really interesting. Um, one, the most basic and fundamental is it's got to be uniform. It's a system based on uniform measurements that would be applied not only across France, where they were first proposed, the French kind of are the authors of the metric system in the 1780s and 90s, uh, but they wanted to be used all around the world. Here. Um, and it looked for a while, the United States Congress actually voted to approve the metric system um, in the early 1790s. Britain was on board. A lot of countries lined up before the Napoleonic Wars um, behind the idea of a uniform measurement system. Here. So that seemed, there was a moment in the 1790s where it looked like the world might go um, finally to this dream that in some ways goes all the way back to the Bible. Of one weight, one measure, one law. Everyone bound together by right, um, a uniform system. Here's where it gets really interesting though. They insisted that the system had to be based on nature. It wouldn't be what they would call a fiat system where you would just declare this bar, which has been the standard for Paris for 400 years and it's, it's mortised into the walls of the Cathedral of Justice. Like, they said, no, we need a standard for all time, for all people. It's got to be based in nature itself. So one possibility, the leading possibility, is this idea of a pendulum. Here. That if you take a pendulum swinging in one second, um, that, that itself is about the length of a yard, or what they were going to make a meter, so they thought that would be a great potential standard. There were all kinds of other possibilities here. But behind it, there was an even deeper philosophical idea, which is that it needs to belong to all people, to all time. And standards can corrode, they can be destroyed, they can be contested, but if it's rooted in nature, then anyone around the world can measure it for themselves and recreate it here. And no one is privileged by the standard. It's nature itself. So it'll be timeless, it'll be eternal, it'll be for all people. Um, another key thing is they want to have an integrated system. This is kind of new. They want length, weight, volume, density, all the things by which you measure, they want them to all be interconnected. So they decided that for the metric purposes, weight will be a cubic centimeter of water. So they're using the actual length of the meter to define a cubic centimeter of water measured in vacuo, in those vacuum pumps like we talked about last week here. Um, that's going to define uh, the, the volume, I mean weight here. So they have all these different kind of integrated things. They decided that they wanted it to be a decimal system. This was a sticking point for a lot of people. But there's this belief that decimal systems are much more rational, that will create like a calculating people that are able to use it. It's easier to use in terms of mathematics for science and potentially for commerce. Um, so they're kind of talking about counting in base 10. But as I was mentioning to other people, um, there were lots of other proposals. Some people wanted to count in base 12. So you could divide things repeatedly by half. So 12 goes into 6, 6 into 3. Other people wanted to have it based on uh, base six or eight, or no, eight, because you can kind of continually divide here. My favorite is that someone proposed that they divide by base 11, because they said, well, the meter is supposed to be indivisible, it's supposed to be the eternal standard, but the metric system shouldn't be able to be divided, it should be based on prime number, so one out of 11. And I think what's interesting about these things is that there's this moment in the 1790s in which people believe you can basically redesign anything, make it rational, make it base 11, make it base eight, there's no concern for tradition. There's no concern for the uh, way people have done things in the past. You have, in a sense, a blank slate. You have a chance to redesign society, and then, by extension, redesign how people think and calculate. So this is so. There's a utopian aspect to it. I think that's kind of important to realize. That people really thought the metric system would mold people, would create a new kind of person out of the Enlightenment. 
break the old customs of rates and measures. Um, and in order to help do that, they, they insist on systematic nomenclature, which is another very popular scientific technique. Let's get rid of old words that have old meanings, and we're going to create Greek nomenclature. So, kilo, deco, you know, for the meter, and things like that, milla. So, we're going to create this whole kind of new way of naming. Um, so, you imagine it's kind of a shock to people uh, to propose this. But it's only one of a number of sweeping reforms that happened during the age of the French Revolution. My favorite is the attempt uh, that the French do to create decimalized time. Why not create time in units of 10 rather than based on 12 here? So this is an example. This clock is hedging here. It's got both 10s and if you read along the outside, you can see the 12. I think it was made in Belgium or something, so they were kind of always iffy about this. But um, it reflects the values of the French Revolution. You see the little Phrygian cap of liberty, the French flag. But basically, as the French Revolution became more and more radical, the attempt was made to kind of unroot every aspect of what they would call the old regime that shaped people's lives. So get rid of the old system of time that was designed by the church anyway. Get rid of the old calendar, create a calendar of 10 months. Rename all the months, Fructor, Thermidor, they're all kind of the French calendar, <laughs> name them after different parts of the season because they want the peasants to be connected deeply to their actual everyday activities, harvesting, things like that. Um, so there's this uh, attempt, um, and a lot of this is, is led by scientists themselves here. There's this kind of, like I said, almost a hyper-utopian, hyper-rational vision. They even go so far as to redesign the system of degrees by which all mathematics is done. Um, so they said, instead of 360 degrees, which the Babylonians gave us, let's do 400 degrees. So that a right angle will now be 100 degrees instead of 90 degrees and so forth. Interestingly enough, when the scientists actually mess with their own measurements, they seem to pull back a little bit more. So a lot of the astronomers and mathematicians, they, uh, this went too far. Like, we're, not, we're not interested in, in calculating things all again based on angles. But it was this moment, like I said, where science seemed to have um, carte blanche to redo um, kind of society. And so I don't have a, enough time today to really go into all the details, but I just want to say a quick word about the actual Meridian expedition. Right? So those are the principles of the um, metric system, these five-fold issues. Uh, and I talked about the kind of little bit of the radical atmosphere in which everything was up for change. Um, they decided, though, not to go with a pendulum experiment, which could be done. This is what actually led the US, Britain, and other countries to break off from the idea of the metric system. Instead, the French decided, the committee decided, we want to base the meter on the Earth itself, not on a swinging pendulum. Partly because they're about to redesign time itself. They're about to go to a decimal time system. So a second is going to be different in France than it will be in England. Right? Because there's not going to be 12 hours to the you know, 24 hours to the day and whatnot. So they decided instead we were going to make the meter based on one ten millionth of a quarter arc of the meridian. So imagine a line running from the North Pole all the way down to the equator. That's a quarter meridian. And they're going to divide that into one. They're going to measure it. Sorry, they're going to measure it from Dunkirk down to Barcelona. So it runs right through Paris, coincidentally. Um, <laughs> so this is where a lot of the suspicion comes in. You know, kind of, this is supposed to be universal, kind of reflect no one's interest. But the Jefferson and others say, well, if we want to measure the arc, how will we do that? We're going to come to France to measure it. Um, yeah. Ironically himself, Jefferson proposed the pendulum experiment. He thought the best latitude to do that, because pendulums actually have different periods based on where they are on the Earth, because gravity is different in different parts of the Earth. So a one-second pendulum in Paris is not the same as a one-second pendulum at the equator. Here. So they had to decide, where would you record a pendulum if you want to make that the universal? And Jefferson says 39 degrees latitude. That's the perfect line. It's halfway between, it's the perfect average between the U.S., between Maine, in South Carolina. It also happens to be the exact line that runs through Monticello. Yeah. Yeah, it's this example. Up. So everyone has their own kind of pet project that they see, uh, to be pushing. But the French say, look, this won't be a big deal because we've actually created the best maps in Europe. We've actually measured this baseline before. In fact, we've done it four times here. Um, and so they plan to do this. They say, we can do this in five months. We can have a meter. We can they say measure this baseline, and then from there we'll calculate what the whole meridian quarter would be. We'll divide it up by one ten millionth. We'll cut platinum bars, and we'll send them to people. And that will be the new kind of metric system. 
It turns out, as I say at the bottom here, like it ends up being one of the most interesting kind of expeditions in all of science, I think. It takes about eight years and ends up costing over half a million livres, which is an enormous amount of money here. Um, so, and the drama and both personal, political, and scientific is really amazing in this expedition. The leaders of it here, two men are, are tasked with leading the expedition. One heads north from Paris, one heads south. Um, and they don't meet each other until eight years later. And in the meantime, they get arrested several times, in fact, because especially as they went through the countryside with their really strange equipment, telling people we're, we're creating a new system of weights and measures, we just want to measure everything in your area. Uh, peasants were very suspicious of what they were doing, especially because they kind of rightly understood that greater measurement brings greater power as far as taxation for the government. Like, maps are kind of a form of power. Maps show where everything is, and especially the French government was talking about how they were going to create cadastral maps, land, land ownership maps, like today's plot, plot maps if you're on a county land. What does everyone own? How much land do they own? So this is a potentially dramatic move. Um, and so peasants tend to, like, tear down signal posts. They tend to arrest these people. They also were sent out originally under the king's order. So they have all these scrolls of Latin with the king's name. But they're going through France during the middle of the French Revolution. The king has been executed. And so they, their political loyalties are always suspect here. And so then, in order to do this project, they also have to cross into Spain, because they have to go down to Barcelona for the end point. And so France and Spain are at war during this time period. So they're kind of constantly. So they, I can suggest, if anyone would like to read more, there's a couple great books about this expedition, um, uh, about all the kind of personal drama. But I did want to focus a little bit, too, on the, um, there is a lot of scientific drama as well. What they're trying to do is measure the Earth with unparalleled precision here. And this is a little bit like our friend Riccioli with his pendulum. These are people, one of the, the main reason it takes eight years to do is because they're taking, at one point, um, McCann here, the senior figure, in order to fix the latitude of Barcelona, he takes over 10,000 observations of stars. Uh, these are people who aren't happy with just fixing geographic points to within a couple hundred yards. They want to have it within feet. In fact, some of them get more accurate than today's GPS here. Galam and Macan, some of their numbers are within 10 to 12 feet accuracy of a location, which is startling. Before this time period, most attempts to fix your location on the Earth might be good within, say, 600 feet or 1,000 feet. It's kind of very rough <coughs> estimates here. But these are people who are looking for really intense um, precision. And what they're using is this famous device called the border repeating circle, where you have two scopes. It basically allows you to measure the angles. Whether you're measuring the angles of a triangle, and this is how they measure distance on land. They create a series of triangles, as we saw here, the series of triangulation that run along the baseline. And basically, they're kind of measuring each one of these triangles, they're measuring the angles on them here. Once they know all the angles, they'll take two baseline measurements. One is up here by Carcassonne, uh, and one is up here by Amiens. And they're going to take rulers, these special platinum rulers, and they're going to, for six miles, measure one base of a triangle. Here. It takes them about five months to do each one. Here. And they redid them in the 1890s, and they showed that they were only off by, I think, like three centimeters or something. It's a remarkable feat. These were special um, platinum rulers that had uh, thermometers inside them. So I don't know if they're recording the measurement, but they were recording the exact temperature of each measurement in a logbook, so that then when they got back to Paris, they would calculate how much had the thermometer, how much had the ruler expanded. Right? Because at different temperatures, it expands or contracts. So they're measuring. And they're doing the same thing with all these angular measurements. They're having to calculate, do whatnot um, for them. So these two men, they take it upon themselves to kind of record all of this material. I think one of the most fascinating things is that they actually, before they set out and even during the mission, they never agree upon um, uniform methods of recording this information. Here. So they don't say, like, what decimal point are you going to carry yours out to? or um, how many measurements are you going to make of this latitude. They never once kind of agree on um, a uniform set of standards for their own data. Which I think is really revealing because um, it was seen as their right and obligation as what they would call themselves savants, right? Um, to, to record data as they saw fit. So there was no attempt, even though they're trying to create uniform measurements for everyone, they themselves are not interested in creating uniform measurements. They themselves are interested in finding truth. 
And I mention this because one of the things that happens during this expedition is that this figure, Andre Pierre Macan, um, ends up believing that he's made a mistake in his calculations. He believes that his angular measurements for the latitude of Barcelona, so the end point of this long arc, he thinks that they're off. Um, in fact, he measures, the, and he can never go back to the fort because it's controlled by the Spanish, and so they won't let him back. And so throughout his life, he's kind of hounded by this potential error here. He tries to find out what, what could be wrong. He ends up going back, and um, you get in a lot of trouble for this today. He ends up recalculating his numbers. He erases numbers. He folds some data sets into others. He does a lot of things that, again, today would, would probably bring you up on all kinds of academic honesty problems. Um, but at the time, it was seen as his right and prerogative, because his sole job was to produce the end result, the number that people could trust. And his moral character was why people believed um, his numbers here. So there's, this, there's an interesting moral aspect to the drama. Um, that was so it took about seven years. They bring back all the numbers. They have an international conference. Napoleon says that he wants the whole world to sign off on the metric system. And so they all meet, the savants of the world meet to calculate the meter. It turns out there's kind of two scandals. One is people are trying to figure out what did McCann do with his data and how much does it affect the meter itself here. But even more surprising is that the metric expedition discovered its own scandal, which is that the Earth isn't uniform. Yeah. So one of the things that they were expecting to do, you know, they were trying to create a meter based on the uniform. Now they know that the Earth has mountains. Like the, what they're measuring when they measure this arc of the meridian, they're not measuring the Earth at its surface, like as they go up and down hills, because that's very irregular. A meridian that measured the surface would be very different in Paris than it might be in the Rocky Mountains, right? You have very different. So they understand that. So they're instead measuring what they call the geoid, or the figure of the Earth. What would the Earth look like if it were covered with just water? It was kind of a perfect sphere here. Um, and they knew it wasn't going to be a perfect sphere, but they thought it would be very close. And what ends up being produced by this hyper-accurate data is that they discovered that the, world, the Earth is actually very, um, very ununiform. That it looks much more like a lumpy potato in terms of its kind of thing. So I, I don't have an image with me here, but I'll bring one maybe tomorrow or something. Or if you go, if you go online, you can look up the European... Um, Union has a satellite that's released the most accurate pictures of what they consider the geoid to look like. And it is this really strange looking, deformed kind of thing. So basically, back to our point about curves, if they try to fit a curve, what would the curve of the Earth look like as it runs from Dunkirk to Barcelona? You can't even create one curve. It would look like this. It kind of have all of these endpoints. And so they end up deciding, um, there's a bit of an irony here, they spent eight years measuring this reality, and then they end up deciding, well, we can't, this is too, it's almost too shocking for people to imagine that the Earth isn't uniform and eternal. So instead they pick a different number, and they just use that to calculate. They just say, well, let's imagine the Earth were just an ellipse, and just calculate it that way. So they created a meter which is actually less accurate um, than the one that they had beforehand, as far as knowledge moved backwards in an interesting sense. Um, with this expedition here. So, and that's what's embodied even to today. The current meter that's defined as the length at which light travels in one 299 millionth of a second. It's a very strange definition. That's how we calculate it today. It's based on getting the exact number that this metric expedition discovered here. So, um, uh, so let me just uh, kind of end on some questions about about the, the meter that I have up here. Was the meter more natural? Was it more natural? Was it more rational? Was it more uniform? Um, one of the things that I think is really important is to understand why people, because ordinary people um, did not like the meter uh, in the metric system. And so I wanted to kind of end on this point about what was the old system of measurements like that people replaced? And why was this new system so controversial and so desired by um, savants? And so one of the things that's interesting is the old system was it's about France, but all throughout Europe, it was highly local. Every town had its own weights and measures. Now that can be seen as a bad thing as far as trade and commerce, but it's an intensely good thing for local people in terms of A, keeping outside businesses outside. So imagine your you know, local mom and pop stores. They don't want big companies coming in. So local weights and measures allow you to create smaller markets that protect local people, which is a value of traditional society. They also mean that they're intensely negotiated by the community members itself, and they're very personal. So if you measure something in the old regime, you literally, ritually measure. There is no pre-measure. 
Right? You don't buy things that are pre-measured. You insist that the person pull out the bar and measure it with ritual flair. And every town has different customs. So if you're taking grain in a bushel in one town, you might tap the bushel to get the grain to fall down. Another town, you strike it off the top. Another town, it might be heaped. You insist that the bushel has to be heaped, and it's just about whether or not it will fall off. So every town has its own rituals, and there's always one local authority who is responsible for ensuring that it's done fairly. And so there's no impersonal or arbitrary measurements. It's all done in the watchful eye of a local authority member, who you yourself can sometimes pressure. And so these standards change over time. As grain prices rise, people get hungry. People insist that we need to switch to a struck basket or whatnot here. Um, so there's all these things. More importantly, I think what's more interesting is that uh, these systems are highly anthropocentric. They're based on human values and uses. So in France, land is measured very differently in every community, but often it's measured by how many bushels of seed would you sow in a piece of land, not how big it is. And so what you're doing there is you're measuring the quality of the land. A good piece of land might, might take 20 bushels of seed, whereas a wasteland might only take five bushels. Also, you measure by, in some communities, by how, mu how much labor it takes to sow or to plow the plot. So a plot of land is decided as two journeys, which means it takes two men each working a day to work the land. And the same with vineyards. So what's really interesting about that is it locks in ideas of fairness, of value, of how much you work. I mean, try hiring someone to, to work a two-journey piece of land by himself. Right? He's not going to do it. By its very definition, it's supposed to be two people working each a day. So this is what made it so problematic to the world of the Enlightenment. There was no way to see and calculate profitability, productivity, price. This babble of weights and measures very much fit the values of local communities, but not the values of the economy, of, the economy of science. And so there's a real tension in this effort to replace them. As you know, the metric system has become universal. I think there's only two countries. I think someone can correct me. Maybe there's three. The U.S. and I can't remember if it's like Burkina Faso or something. It's another country uh, besides us. But, uh, but one of the things I would say is it would be much easier for us today to move to the metric than it would have been for a, an ordinary person in the 17th century. Because today our weights and measures are also impersonal and abstract. You know, they are also run by the state. None of us see bushels being weighed. Um, in many ways, they share the same qualities of the metric system. It's kind of modern, rational, abstract impersonal system of measurements. Um, and so uh, I think this was one really important moment where science kind of really literally kind of transformed the world with the metric system. And as I started off the talk by saying, you know, we spend about 6% of our GDP on measurement. Um, all throughout society, uh, science and measurement kind of steadily advanced from beyond obviously things like the metric system to measuring school participation in ways, measuring um, things like the census, measuring social statistics. Economics was transformed from a qualitative study to a quantitative discipline, measuring productivity, GDP, things like that. So um, we very much live in a kind of world in which everything now is kind of subject to numbers. Um, and science played a really big role um, in helping that happen for good or for ill. Uh, I, we wanted to end on, um, have any of you read Hard Times by Charles Dickens? It's one of the really interesting pieces in terms of this theme of science and numbers because the great major character for that is a figure named Brad Grind, uh, who just kind of always yells, just the facts, just the facts, or just the numbers. And he teaches in a schoolhouse and he insists that all the children be called by number rather than by name. So number 23, number 24. And he's always talking about statistics. That is his kind of um, go-to discussion. That's how he sees the world. He's very much a caricature, kind of like I talked about Jonathan Swift making fun of experimentalism in Gulliver's Travels. Um, Grad Grind is very much a caricature of this new world of science and numbers here, which some people found exhilarating, fascinating, other people thought um, you lose a lot by turning things into numbers. So. Anyway, I will stop there, and uh, next week we'll move on to talk about classification. Yeah. Um, Roman numerals versus Arabic uh, numbers. I'm sure glad we don't use the Roman numerals anymore, except for movies, you know, when they put when the movies right. are uh, uh, released. But um, the, the Roman numerals were based on the decimal system, sort of, yeah. And so were the Arabic numbers.
um, and I imagine that's because we've got ten fingers, uh, was switching to the decimal system really? You know, you were talking about, you know, someone at 11, someone at 6. Uh, wasn't it fairly easy to get the decimal system through? Didn't it, didn't it just make a lot more sense? Okay, so the question is, did, since the Roman system was based on decimal, didn't the decimal system, wasn't it a little bit easier to push through? It depended on the field. People that worked in some of these mathematical professions and trades, a lot of ordinary people were used to the decimal system beforehand. A lot of what happened in France was peasantry that were kind of opposed to it here. Um, and there's a, there is a little bit of difference between counting in base 10 and using decimals as a technique of either measuring or calculating here. So there's a little bit of a difference there. But in general, no, it would be easier to count in base 10 or to decimalize than it would be to switch to one of these other systems. Then the U.S. switched to decimal currency and other things without a problem. So yeah, in general, it's not a particularly hard system, especially since school students were trained in it. Yeah. Uh, I like to tell one, I think, amusing incident that happened to me. Uh, I lived in Brooklyn for a number of years and we built a track down there, and our Qantas club used to sponsor a girls' track uh, uh, meet. We'd invite a lot of teams in. And our club worked together to do this whole thing. We invite the teams and all this and that. We do the timing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in 1976, we went from 100, meter, 100 yards to 100 meters. We had to change the track to a 400 meter. And all my, I got all my guys together. We're going to run this track meet. And one fella uh, from World War II, veteran, and was a mailman, he says, Jack, he says, I cannot in good conscience help you with this meet this year because the metric system is a communist plot to ruin the economy <laughs> to ruin the economy of the free world and besides who won the war <laughs> and you can now respond as a French <laughs> well, that's a great story well thank you very much uh, this is the end of the second class of Mike Gunther's course on science and society uh, from Newton to Darwin. We we'll look forward to seeing you all back again next week. Thank you.